Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Search Inside Yourself is a curriculum on emotional intelligence. And you may ask, what is emotional intelligence? So the best answer is with, to answer the question is with a, a parable. It's a parable of a man on the horse. So the man was, was just on the horse and he was just going along. And there's a guy on the street asking the guy on the horse, say, hey, rider, where are you going? And the guy on the horse says, I don't know, why are you asking me? You should be asking the horse, duh. <laughs> Which sounds ridiculous. Uh, however, it is something we, we engage in every day. Because the horse here represents our emotional life or our emotional mind, and the rider represents our thinking mind, uh, our thinking self. Right? And we have, we have this uh, illusion that the horse controls the rider, that, that emotions control us. We have no control over our emotional life. Sometimes it gets worse. Sometimes it feels like this. <laughs> Large parts of my life. If you're feeling angry, if you're feeling hateful, you're feeling jealous, uh, so on and so forth, right? It feels like this. So my friends, that's good news. The good news is that you can go from this to this. <laughs> you can go from, with enough training, go from skilllessness with the horse to skillfulness with the horse. In other words, you can train emotional intelligence. Learn to at least influence where the horse goes. Right? The better news is that you can go from this to this. You can go from skilllessness to skillfulness and eventually mastery, mastery over your emotional life. So what is emotional intelligence? The standard definition is this. The ability to monitor one's own and others' feelings and emotions to discriminate among them, and most importantly, to use this information to guide one's thinking and actions. So that's the standard definition. There is another definition of EI, which I think is, is shorter and more powerful, in my, in my opinion, which is that emotional intelligence is a collection of emotional skills. And that is important, why? Because all skills are trainable. Therefore, if EI is just a collection of skills, emotional skills, then EI must be trainable. So the good news is it's trainable. The, bad, the better news is that we, it turns out from our experience that you can train emotional intelligence to a meaningful degree, to a degree that's life-changing for some people in as little as seven weeks, 20 hours of training. It turns out that EI cannot be learned. It can only be trained. The reason it can be trained is because of a feature of the brain called neuroplasticity which is that what we think, what we do, and what we pay attention to changes the function and structure of the brain. There are a couple of neuroscientists they were on an airplane, and they wanted to study neuroplasticity. And so they were they talking loudly to themselves on the airplane. It's like, where can we find a population of people who does a specific thing, and, and the specific thing is something that we know, we know what's the neural correlate, that way, way it happens in the brain, right? And, and we can study it. And, and as you're talking, somebody from the next seat, total stranger, says, London cabbies, <laughs> right? Because in order to get a license to drive a cab, you need to take the test, right? To navigate all the streets in London in the head. And we know where that part of the brain, uh, the part of the brain responsible for that is, the hippocampus. So uh, the hippocampi of London cabbies were studied. And it turns out that they have bigger and more active people can buy than normal people, and the longer they've been driving a cab, the more true that is. And that was the first evidence of neuroplasticity in adults. So how do you do this? How do you train emotional intelligence? You can do this in three easy steps. And step one is attention training. When I say attention, I'm talking about something fairly specific, which is the attentional ability to bring the mind to a state that's calm and clear calm and clear mind, and to do that on demand. In other words, to calm the mind on demand. Bring the mind to this state, calm and clear. The first reason is important. 
is uh, something that is uh, described by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl says that between stimulus and response, there is a space. And that space lies your freedom and power to choose your response. And the, if you have the ability to calm the mind on demand, what happens? That space becomes reliably accessible. The space between stimulus and response. Therefore, what do you get? You get choice, power, freedom. <coughs> freedom, my friends, from this one simple skill. If you are a leader, this skill is, turns out to be a mark of leadership. So for example, if, if you are in, in a meeting room of peers, right, and, and let's say there's a, there's a crisis and everybody is panicking, and you alone, because of this skill, you alone can calm the mind as you're panicking, calm the mind and think clearly. And if you can do that, what happens? People look at you and say, huh, Celia, that Celia, she's always calm in crisis. And they feel she's a leader, right? And if you're in a company, next year's promotion cycle, guess who gets considered? You get considered if you have this skill. So this is an important leadership skill. And it gets better. This skill is also the foundation of all higher cognitive and emotional skills. So this is a, this, you train this, it prepares you for emotional intelligence. The way to do that is with a simple technique called mindfulness. <laughs> Which is defined very simply as this, as paying attention, but not just paying attention, paying attention on, in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and most importantly, non-judgmentally. For 10 seconds, bring attention to the process of breathing, whatever that means to you. And if you need something more specific, attend to the sensation and nose as you breathe. And every time attention wanders away, bring it back. That's all. Every time your attention wanders away, you bring it back. It's like strengthening, it's like doing one bicep curl for the mind. Like if you do, every time you bring attention back, it's like strengthening the neurological mechanisms that, bring, that controls your attention, specifically the prefrontal cortex. And if you do that a lot, then you gain mastery over attention. And that mastery allows you, among other things, the skill to calm the mind on demand. The second step is uh, self-knowledge that leads to self-mastery. So what does that mean? Remember I said, bring your mind to a state that's calm and clear on demand, right? I talk about calmness, I even talk about clarity. So what does clarity mean? Clarity here, specifically, if, if you have the attentional mastery, you begin to perceive emotions differently. You begin to create a high resolution perception into the process of emotion. High resolution. Again, what does that mean? So to illustrate here is a picture, a low resolution picture. If we increase the resolution, you realize, ah, it's a picture of some old guy trying to hide the recipe of chicken. <laughs> so what resolution does for you is it gives you useful information. And it's the same with perception of the emotional process. Specifically, we are increasing it on two dimensions. The first is a spatial dimension, which means the ability to perceive small changes in the process of emotion. The second is a temporal dimension, which means to perceive it in thin slices of time or for engineers among you, in real time. Right? Combine, you get insights into an emotional life that leads to profound changes. When we experience emotion, we think of it in existential terms. For example, I say I am happy, I am sad, I am angry, right? I am, I am that emotion. That emotion is me, there is no separation. And as your perception into the emotional process sharpens over time, you may introduce a subtle shift in the way you see it. You go from I am angry to I am experiencing anger, which, which seems like a small shift, right? However, it has profound implications because this tiny shift introduces the possibility of something called a big sky mind, which is that the mind is like the sky and emotions are like clouds in the sky. 
fundamentally the clouds are not the sky. And therefore, in the same way, my emotions are not me. My emotions are not me. My thoughts are not me. I am not my emotions. I am not my thoughts. And if you're somebody who's stuck in a cycle of, for example, stuck in a cycle of depression, that one insight, I am not my emotions, I am not my thoughts, that one insight is the first break out of the cycle of depression. Very powerful uh, insight. Life-changing. As your perception sharpens even more, you may, you may see another shift, which is going from experiential to physiological. So in this case, it's going from I am experiencing anger to I am experiencing anger in my body. Right, what does that mean? Right, so again, if, if, I, if I'm too animated as I talk, I might hurt my hand. Right? And if I hurt my hand, I'm going to feel pain. But however, I know this pain is, is entirely an experience in my body. It's entirely physiological. And because of that, I have options. I, I, can, I can massage, I can ice, you know. I can ignore, I can distract by having ice cream, and so on. I can experience it mindfully because I came to a talk about mindfulness. Like a range of options because this is simply an experience in my body. Imagine being able to see the process or the experience of emotion simply as an experience in the body. The same level, this sadness that I'm feeling, the same level of experience as this pain in my hand. If you become able to perceive that, that, my friends, is a beginning of mastery over the emotional process. It's that, it's that powerful. It's life-changing. Step three is creating useful mental habits. When I say useful here, specifically, I mean pro-social mental habits. So what does that mean again? I'll give you an example. Uh, one pro-social mental habit is a habit of kindness, which is to look at a human being. And the first thought is, I wish for this person to be happy. I, I wish for that person to be happy. As your first thought, why? Because it is a habit. For no other reason than because this is my habit. Imagine having that habit. Like, what happens? Everything changes. Right? Because habit becomes personality. Personality becomes you. And eventually, having a habit of kindness turns you into a kind person. It changes you. And all it takes is to train a habit of the mind. You might ask, uh, how do you train this habit? It's very simple. The same way you train any other habit. If you do something often enough, it becomes a habit. That's all. Simple as that. So let's, let's try this. Okay? 10 seconds. Very easy. Uh, for 10 seconds, identify two human beings in this room. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. Just think. Think, I wish for that person to be happy, and I wish for that person to be happy. That's all. That was it. Did you notice you were smiling when you did that? <laughs> yeah? And my friends, you may, if, you may discover this. You may discover that to be on the giving end of a kind thought is intrinsically rewarding. That means, my friends, you may have just found a secret for happiness. All other things equal. All you have to do is to wish for people to be happy randomly, and you'll be happy. So how far can you push that? Uh, a couple of months ago, I gave a talk to an audience of roughly this size in, in San Francisco. I said, OK, tomorrow is a work day. Try this. Tomorrow, go back to work. Every hour, spend 10 seconds randomly wishing for two people to be happy. Again, don't do, it, don't do anything, don't say anything, just think. Okay? That was Monday. Wednesday morning, I received an email from a total stranger. And this person says, I hate my job. I hate coming to work every single day. However, I came to your talk on Monday, and on Tuesday, I tried out that experiment you suggested, and Tuesday was my happiest day in seven years. So what, does, what happens with this? So first thing is it benefits your soul. Right? It's good for your soul. If you're a kind person, if you're a loving person, it can't be bad for you, right? The better news is that this skill is very useful for success. Because if you go into a meeting room, and consistently, every time you walk into a meeting room, you look at people and you wish for them to be happy. What happens? It reflects on your body language. 
reflects on your, your posture, your facial tone, and so on and so forth. And people, they pick it up unconsciously, and they like you. And because they like you, eventually they want to help you succeed. And they don't really know why they like you. They think it's because of your good looks and, and your, Chinese, your nice Chinese suit. <laughs> but it's because you're wishing for them to be happy. And if you're a leader, there was a study done uh, in, in California, published in 2003. So the study investigated what differentiated the top performing managers from the bottom performing managers. And in this study, they found only one difference. And the one difference is affection. The top performing leaders they love people, and they want to be loved. Which is surprising. At least for me, it's surprising, right? If you grow up thinking that, that being a boss means being nasty, right? otherwise things don't get done, you say, like, wait a minute, this doesn't make a lot of sense. If you love people, you're more successful as a boss. Why? It turns out there's a very simple explanation, which is that all other things equal. The more your people like you, Oh, sorry, the more they love you, the harder they work for you. And therefore, it reflects on your success. It's as simple as that. I gave this talk to a bunch of uh, naval officers who came to visit Google. And, and these are the, the type of top performing officers. And among them, they were like uh, Navy SEALs and Top Gun pilots. Like the best of the best of the best. And I asked them this question. I, I, I told them this, I showed this slide and I said, is this true for you? And they all said yes. So now I know it's, it's, it's confirmed, right? So even for Navy SEALs, even for Top Gun pilots, the best of the best, being nice makes you a good leader. Last story to tell before I, I give the stage. Why did I do this? Like, how, like, why did I start searching inside yourself? It's very simple. I had one simple wish. All I wanted to do was to create the conditions for world peace in my lifetime. How to do that? I figured it out. I figured the way to do that is to scale inner peace, inner happiness, and compassion worldwide. Because if, if these three qualities are scaled worldwide, then we have conditions for world peace in my lifetime, in our lifetimes. How to do that? I figured it out. Which is that the way to do that is to align these three qualities with success and profits. Because if I were to go around speaking at RSA and everywhere about goodness, we should all be compassionate. We should all be nice to people. Eh, eh. Yeah, and they go home, right? <laughs> However, if I talk about success and profits, this will help you succeed. This will get you your next promotion. And it's good for the world. And it's good for you. And it creates a condition for world peace. Right? So success and profits with world peace being the necessary and unavoidable side effect. Then it will spread. Then we have the conditions for world peace in my lifetime. How do we do that? And I figured it out. The way to do that was emotional intelligence. Because everybody knows EI, good for my career, good for my team. And nobody really knows how to train it among adults. And we figured it out in a way that is also creates peace, joy, compassion. So that started me on this journey. And that's where I am right now. And my friends, I hope that uh, this talk was helpful to you. And together, we can create the conditions for world peace in our lifetimes. What I'm interested in particularly is the fact that this has come about from, the, from a work organization, from a place of work where presumably there's a quite high intensity of work and a lot of people having to meet very competing demands in a very dynamic environment. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, as you say, from an engineering background where some of this stuff mm -hmm. invites the... WTF <laughs> question. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think many of us experience, and the data shows this as well, for many people, mm. working life is intensifying, it's right. becoming more mm. unstable, precarious. Mm. We're always on, we have technology all the time we have to mm. interact with and we have to be available to people. So, I mean, I'm interested in how it is that we can offset that and try to develop these habits or these practices mm -hmm. when all of these trends are pushing us towards a kind of fractured attention, um, a lack of compassion perhaps, a lack of um, sense of kindness towards others because competition is intensifying all the time. Right. I mean, in a place like Google, mm -hmm. 
in one hand, there is a very enabling environment for that to happen because you have your 20% time where you can start something and see it happening. Yeah. But in many organizations, perhaps that wouldn't be the case. Mm -hmm. So, so how, how does it work in a work organization to make this something that can be really right. accessible for people? I think there are three steps. Uh, the first is the understanding, the second is the practice, and the third is the showing the example. So, so the first step is understanding that this is actually good for my career. Like, I'm not, so for example, if I'm taking a micro break, one breath, I'm not taking time away from my job. I'm not having to choose between success and wellness. I'm doing both at once. That the wellness actually contributes to my success. And same thing with kindness. I walk into a room, uh, people who, who I have problems with, uh, in, in my, I look at them with kindness. What happens? Things work out and it's good for me. Right? So again, it's not a choice between one or the other. You choose both at once. So understanding that. The second one is, is the practice. And the practice has two components. There is the micro and the macro practice. The micro practice is doing the practice in very thin slices of time. For example, one breath, right? Random, randomly take one breath, or if things are difficult, take one breath. Uh, the other micro practice is randomly look at a human being and wish for the, guy, the person to be happy, right? Doesn't take time. And do not underestimate the micro practices. Micro practices, very powerful. And the second component of practice is macro practice, which is actually take time, right? Take 10 minutes to sit. It's the same as going to the gym. So micro practice is like, it's like uh, in between buildings, you walk fast, so you get fit. Macro is like you actually go to the gym, so you get fitter. So that's the second part. The third part is show the example. Right? So uh, if, if you're physically fit and, and you're successful at work, right? people get it. And people ask, why is Julian so successful? Well, because he's healthy and fit. I mean, the, the young people come to you and say, why? Because I go to the gym every, every three times a week and so on and so forth, right? And they want to be like you. And the same with mental practices. If you're mentally healthy and fit, and then you are successful because of that, eventually people will notice. People will say, Julian, why is it that you can always so calm? Why is it that you're always so nice with people? And so on. And why is it everybody loves you? Right? And you say, because I've been doing these practices. And by showing the example, you change everything. So these three steps, no understanding, practicing, and being the example. That's all. <laughs>